Hello students of dynamics, welcome to this multi-body example for rigid body impulse and momentum. So in this system, we're going to take a look at a combined pulley as well as a weight that's hanging from the pulley. And so our pulley is hanging from the ceiling. Here is the size of that pulley. Now from the center here, a center pin through the middle of the pulley, we have an additional weight. Now the mass hanging here is 40 kilograms. The pulley itself weighs 30 kilograms. Now just to remind us that if we didn't have a mass for this pulley, if this is a massless pulley, you could treat this problem as particles and it becomes way, way easier. You don't need all of these cross products and all of this rotational information, but that's not the case here. So we have a radius of the pulley equal to 0 0.375 meters. And on the right edge of this pulley, we're pulling upwards with a 380 Newton force. And we're also given additional information that there's an initial downward velocity. So call this V1 equal to 1.2 meters per second. So a couple of things that are interesting about this problem. One of them is that we have initial velocity and we need to determine if this 380 Newtons pulling upwards is actually a large enough force over a certain amount of time. This can be force times time of impulse to basically reverse the direction of the movement and move it upwards. So we'll have to check that. And we also have momentum of both our pulley and also our uh, lower block. Now keep in mind that the pulley is technically in general plane motion. It is rotating as well as it's translating um, initially downwards. And then the block is going to be in pure translation, so we'll only have linear momentum. Okay, so a few other details here. And I'm going to break this up into kind of an initial, during, and after. And the after is going to be the unknown. So um, initial conditions are that the pulley... plus the mass are going downwards at 1.2 meters per second. Uh, we also are given that the radius of gyration about the centroid, K sub G, you could also write it as K bar if you wanted to, is equal to 0 0.25 meters. And just a reminder, that's really just a measurement of the distribution of mass of this pulley. If all of the mass of this pulley was located a distance of 0.25 meters from the center, then that basically thin ring of mass around the center point would have the exact same mass and also the exact same mass moment inertia as the pulley itself. So during... we have this 380 Newton upwards force for five seconds. Okay, that gives us our impulse information, a force over time. And then after we want to find our final angular velocity, omega two, and the tension in the left cable. So that's going to be inside this one here is going to be a tension that we need to find. All right, so that maps out what we know, what we don't know, what we're trying to solve for. Let's go ahead and create a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram. So there's my pulley. Now I have the choice in this problem. If I want to do f separate free body diagrams or essentially a lumped system free body diagram. 
And because we weren't asked to solve for the tension in the connecting cable between the pulley and the lower mass, I think it's going to be best to leave this all as one. It'll give us less work in the end, less unknowns to solve for everything else. All right, so there's our unknown tension force we're going to solve for. Here is our 380 Newton force. We have a weight force of the pulley, which is going to be 30 times the gravitational acceleration, 9.81 meters per second squared. I also have a weight force of 40 times 9.81. Once again, mass times gravity for those weight forces. Now that takes care of all of my free body diagram terms. Let's add on to here our kinetic terms. And those kinetic terms are going to be the following. If we have an initial velocity V1, which is coming downward, then we need to match that up with an omega one, which is gonna be negative from the right-hand rule. That's because fundamentally my contact point here with that cable attached to the ceiling on this problem, we're gonna call that point our IC uh, is an instantaneous center of zero velocity, right? It's not moving at the top. The cable's not moving at the top. It's not moving at the contact point. And so at this instant, that is a zero velocity point on this body, which means that omega must be negative in order for the centroid of the pulley, I could put that on here as well if I wanted to, is also going down at V1, right? So the centroid of the pulley, which we'll call point G, and the centroid of the mass, the 40 kilogram mass, are going to have the same velocity. Okay, I'll call that one V bar. So that gives us a free body diagram and kinetic diagram to base our equations upon. So now we're faced with some choices. Uh, the main choice that we're faced with is if we want to go ahead and sum moments about our centroid versus summing moments about our instantaneous center of zero velocity. Quite honestly, you can go in either direction here. It just kind of depends on how many equations you want showing up in your separate in your separate. It just depends on how many unknowns you want showing up in your separate equations. Uh, for just the exercise here, we're going to go ahead and sum our moments around the IC that should make the motion terms, the omega and the linear velocity V as the only unknowns in our angular impulse momentum equation. Okay, so first you're looking at the angular impulse momentum about our IC point, our instant center of zero velocity. So let me scroll up here so we can still see our free body diagram. I see I must have just left off a zero there, 380 newtons pulling upwards on the right-hand side. And so listing out that equation in the most general form, moment inertia about the centroid, times our omega one. This is a vector. We add to that our momentum moment, R of G relative to our IC point as a vector crossed with MV one of the centroid as a vector. We then add to that our impulse term. Our impulse term is going to be the summation of the moments. Now I'm going to leave a little space here because we do have two different bodies. And so we talked about earlier when we were deriving this equation about these leading summations for multiple bodies. Here's a case where we're going to use those. Once again, if we're going to find our momentum about the IC, we also need to find our moment about the IC and we'll integrate this dt. And then on the right-hand side of the equation is going to look like the linear momentum, excuse me, the angular momentum term initial. That is going to be my moment inertia bar times my angular velocity omega 2 as a vector. We add to that our momentum moment r of g relative to our ic crossed into my mass times my final velocity of that centroid term. All right, and then my last summation here, just highlighting 
uh, I need to add in my angular momentum for both bodies. Now conveniently on this problem, we only have one body that's rotating, but we will see, it actually shows up in this term right here, that there is linear momentum from both bodies related to the motion. And so we'll see how that kind of plays out as we work through this problem. So an initial additional complexity here is we did have initial velocity, which is V1. So um, let me just go ahead and first map out a couple things. First, I can say my moment of inertia about the centroid I bar is equal to M times K sub G squared, my mass times my radius of gyration squared. So this will equal the mass of 30. The rate of gyration given was 0 0.25. We're going to square that term. Gives us a mass moment inertia of 1.875. The units there will be kilogram meter squared. An additional thing to map out is that the velocity of the centroid g is equal to the omega times the distance r of g relative to my ic the scalar form but that's okay because i know my velocity is perpendicular to my r vector so this gives me that bridging relationship between my velocity and my angular velocity and so we can say that the g is equal to the omega of the pulley times the radius distance of 0 0.375. Okay, so it just gives me a couple different terms. This is going to be in meters per second for linear velocity. All right, now bringing down our terms into this equation. We have initially here a I bar, 1.875. 5 times our initial angular velocity. Now from the right hand rule, looking at this omega, which is right here, wrapping your fingers around, putting your fingertips in the direction of the arrow tip, that's going to be negative from the right hand rule. So a negative. Now the omega we can actually solve for, rearranging this equation right here. I know my initial velocity was 1.2 and so it Fundamentally, omega is equal to V over R. And so my velocity of 1.2, my R of 0 0.375. So that gives me my initial angular velocity. Now, looking at the next term, my momentum moment initial, we have a R distance 0 0.375. Five, and we're going to cross that into the velocity, right? Keep in mind, we're summing our momentum about this IC. My R comes over, crossing into a vector going down. It's going to give me a negative cross product, right? This R, R from IC to G, crossed into the velocity going downwards. So let me go ahead and put the negative term out front here. Negative from the right-hand rule times my mass. Now here's where the mass needs to be summed up between the two. Both 30 plus 40, because fundamentally we have two masses that we're changing, two masses that are causing momentum about the IC. Therefore, I need to add in both of those masses, and it turns out they have the exact same velocity. So the sum of my masses times that velocity of 1.2. All right, so that takes care of just kind of highlighting where all these things came from takes care of all those terms in my initial momentum. Next up, we're going to add in our impulse term. Now, looking at the impulse, we will not include this unknown tension force because that goes through the IC point. We'll need to include both of the weight forces. We can actually sum those masses again times that R vector. That'll be negative from the right-hand rule. And then two times the radius, which we call the diameter, times 380 for going upwards. So adding in these terms, we have 30 plus... 40. And once again, this term is going to be negative from the right-hand rule. This is the moment from the weight force. So times my gravity, 9.81, times my length vector, position vector, 
five. Okay, so that gives me the moment, the impulse. Ah, that's good. I, I said moment, and then I was like, ah, is that the moment? I need the full impulse. If I need the full impulse, let me go ahead and put it in here. I'll put it with each term, times five seconds. All right, now we're going to bring this down to the next line. Ran out of room up here. So adding on the second impulse term, which is going to be 2 times 0.375 is 0 0.75 times my 380 vertical force in newtons. That also is going to be times 5 seconds because it needs to be an impulse, not just a moment. Then we hit our equal sign. And then essentially we'll reproduce pretty similar to what we had for initial momentum on the right-hand side. Before I do that, let me highlight. So I'll go with like a little purple highlight here. All of that was my impulse. And then moving over to the right, I now have the same I bar, 1.875. And I have an unknown omega 2. Now I went ahead and assumed that my omega 1 and omega 2 are going to go in the same direction. I don't know that at this point, but I felt like it was an okay assumption to go with. I'm already kind of used to the signs coming from the right-hand rule of assuming that my omega is negative. So I just carried that through. And then I add in the momentum moment. Once again, we have a negative sign of the R cross MV, that distance of 0 0.375. My combined mass is 30 plus 40. And then now expressing my velocity in terms of my omega. So my omega 2 times 0 0.375. And that's taking advantage of this equation that we computed right up here. And the reason I did that is that my problem asked for me to solve for omega. If it asked for linear velocity, I could have left that in terms of the linear velocity. But we'll go ahead and go with omega. So we have a pretty good size equation here, but conveniently, we only have one unknown. It shows up twice. It shows up both on the right-hand side of the equation, once in the first term, and then once in that second term. And so we can solve for that omega. Now, our omega 2 is equal to negative 8.5. 3, that's in radians per second. All right, let's talk about this negative sign. This negative sign tells us that our assumption was wrong. Okay, we assumed that our omega would stay in a negative direction, but it turns out that this 380 newton force is big enough to flip this around. And so it turns out that our omega two, so I can put that omega 2 is equal to 8.53. We assumed it was negative direction. We got a negative value. tells us that we're wrong. So this tells us we are in the positive k hat as this starts to spool upwards. And my units are still radians per second. And I'll go through a little bit further proof of that as we get into the tension force here in the last step. So now looking at linear impulse momentum vertically, so linear impulse momentum in the y direction, so our basic equation is the sum of our m v1 bar vectors plus the sum of our integrals of the sum of our forces in the y direction dt and this is going to equal the sum of the m v2 vector of the centroid now one quick thing to note about these summations out front if you did have a problem, let's say, that had pulleys that resulted in different velocities, then you'd need to separate these terms out. As opposed to just lumping the masses, you'd want to take the, the individual sums of the mass times the velocity of that centroid. Okay, so just in this problem, we had that the centroids both had the same velocity, so we're able to combine these together.
So looking at our free body diagram, kinetic diagram, once again, we're summing forces vertically. We had initial momentum coming downward. We have four forces, T, 380, and the two weight forces all in the vertical direction. So we need to add all of those in. So bringing that together into our equation, we have our combined mass, 30 plus 40. That times our initial momentum, negative 1.2. Now the negative, I realized up here as I was writing this, that I hadn't been explicit so far about my axis system. So let's go with the standard horizontal x, vertical y. So my initial momentum will be negative according to that y axis. That's where I get the negative sign from. We then add in our impulse term. Impulse being there's three terms if I lump my masses. So those three terms are going to be positive 380 minus my combined masses, which is yield 70 times 9.81 and then plus my unknown tension T. Now, once again, we are summing impulse, not summing just forces. And so all of this times five seconds because all of those forces are constant. Therefore, we didn't need to integrate. And on the right-hand side, once again, combined masses of 70 times my, representing here my V bar sub two, now again here, I have the choice if I want to represent this as linear velocity or angular velocity. I'm going to choose to switch this over because we already have omega sub 2. So we can write this that V sub 2 is equal to omega 2 times 0 0.375. And so then I could put in my omega 2 into here. And I'm left with one additional unknown, which is T, which works out well because we need to solve for that T. So we find that T is equal to 368 newtons. Now, I promised a little bit more justification about why this is actually moving up in the end versus down. And so to help us think about that in a little more detail, if we think about all of the downward forces, on this body, we end up with 70 times 9.81, right? 70 kilograms times 9.81 gives us a value of 686.7 newtons. The upward forces, we were given 380, and then we're adding to that a value of 368 newtons. And so we end up with a upward total force of 748.0 newtons. And so it turns out that our upward force is bigger than our downward force. Now that doesn't mean that it's gonna instantaneously change the direction, but over five seconds, it gave us enough impulse to change the momentum of the system that our upward force gave us a upward momentum at the end of the problem. Okay, so that's just kind of a further justification about how we can feel comfortable with the fact that we've solved for a positive omega-2 from the right-hand rule. So this problem, we had multiple rigid bodies. We had a couple of unknowns. Conveniently, the centroids of both the pulley and also the lower block had the same initial velocity. That saved us just some computational work as we were working through it. We did decide on this problem to go ahead and sum our moments about the IC. If you had summed your moments about the centroid, the main thing that would happen is you'd have a second unknown in your angular impulse momentum equation, which would be the tension force. That's, like I said, that's that's the main thing that would happen. You wouldn't have to worry about your kinetic moments at all, excuse me, your momentum moments. You would simply have I bar times omega, but we, we chose the path to minimize our unknowns. We then solved for omega two, Omega-2 found out to be a negative value, which was assumed negative k-hat direction initially. So the negative of a negative is a positive. So the final momentum is coming up, um, basically a positive from the right-hand rule. And then we confirmed that with solving for our tension force, finding that our combined upward forces was larger than our combined downward forces, which yielded that change in momentum.
I hope this example helped you think through. I know this is kind of a long problem, a good number of steps, but make sure to draw your free body diagram and kinetic diagrams. Then you can go ahead and write your equations, paying close attention to the signs in those equations um, based upon your coordinate system and your diagrams. And I hope you're having an awesome day today.